Good morning and welcome to this Euractive virtual conference on ethics and the use of artificial intelligence. Can regulators agree a standard approach? Today's conference is supported by Zurich. The EU digital agenda is marked by a series of broad-ranging reforms intended to guide Europe through the digital transition. With artificial intelligence at the heart of the debate, the issue of ethics is center stage, especially when it comes to regulating data gathering and usage. But who should decide what is ethical when it comes to regulation? A principles-based, human-centered framework could be the solution as policymakers guess the direction in which technology will develop. In recent years, the European Commission has highlighted the importance of becoming a leader in the development of trustworthy AI technologies, but legislating all forms of AI application could slow innovation without tackling its potential harms. And prescriptive over-regulation may hamper the efficiency of new technologies. This could have widespread effects for the EU economy. Innovative use of AI is increasingly visible in all industries, not least in media and advertising. And in the insurance sector, for example, algorithms are being used for quicker processes and uh, for loss prediction and claims handling. So today we'll discuss the ethical principles and the frameworks behind Europe's regulation of artificial intelligence. Join us uh, online with hashtag EA Debates. Uh, we'll, our media team uh, will uh, retweet your comments and send us questions on the Q&A section uh, that you see on your screen as well. We'll bring those to the panel uh, during the course of the discussion and uh, towards the end as well. Uh, please tell us uh, who you are, where you're from as well, if you can, please. Our speakers today, Killian Gross, uh, head of Unit for Technologies and Systems uh, for Digitizing Industry at DG Connect, the European Commission. Uh, we have Anna Michelle Asimokopoulou, member of the European Parliament, the AIDA uh, committee member also. Uh, Lien Chivo, Senior Policy Analyst for the Centre for Data Innovation. And uh, Rie Ferreira, Group uh, Chief Data Governance Officer at Zurich. We hope to be joined also by Eva Kali, uh, MEP also. Good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, I want to kick off this morning with just a quick introductory statement uh, from each of you. Uh, let's start with uh, Killian Gross. Good morning, Killian. Floor is yours, sir. Um, I think you summarized it very well in the introductory statement. We believe in the Commission that artificial intelligence is, above all, a great opportunity. It's a chance for society. We see this in the COVID crisis, where um, artificial intelligence is very helpful to discover vaccines or strategies. It can help our economy to stay competitive. So we have an ambitious plan for artificial intelligence because we think it's a groundbreaking, a disruptive technology which Europe can't miss. On the other hand, we realize that there are certain risks related to artificial intelligence. And these risks are in particular um, related to fundamental rights and as well to safety if artificial intelligence is, for instance, used in a car or in a robot. And for fundamental rights, for instance, if you have artificial intelligence in a recruitment tool or in a biometric identification tool where it can have a significant impact on people. We therefore believe that wherever artificial intelligence is used in uh, what we call high risk, but, but or we could as well say in sensitive areas where there is a uh, significant impact on human life, on the course of life or on our societies, we need to make sure that this artificial intelligence is trustworthy and complies with our standards and our values. So, um, and we believe that we therefore need a framework which can ensure that it's all artificial intelligence used and developed on our market complies with these ethical principles and rules and is, uh, in one word, trustworthy. We think, therefore, if we manage uh, this uh, to really have a risk-based approach, so to focus on the areas where such risk can materialize, we can uh, achieve both objectives, to boost artificial intelligence and to make sure that only artificial intelligence uh, is on our market, which is trustworthy and therefore can be taken up by the consumer without any hesitations. Thanks. Thank you so much for a great introduction. Uh, Anna Michelle Simakopoulou, a uh, quick statement from you too. Thanks very much for the invitation. <laughs> There's a lot of fascinating high level discussions like this one today taking place on AI, which is what I would call like the flavor of the digital decade. And of course, COVID has, you know, pressed this fast forward on everything digital. And so as we approach the new normal, um, analyzing these vast amount of data um, about health in order to understand and to deal with the consequences of the virus has also 
prompted us to invest a lot more heavily in artificial intelligence and, um, and data management. And at the heart of these discussions, of course, are technological considerations, ethical considerations, legal considerations, and socioeconomic discussions. And I think that when we talk about AI, the immediate concerns of citizens that we're looking to address have to do with privacy and bias, for example, in these current AI systems. Medium term, people are, are much more worried about um, if AI and robotics are going to, for example, replace them at work. And longer term, I think they're worried about these scenario, of, you know, that that AI will somehow exceed and surpass human capabilities. So many of our citizens are very afraid of this technological change. And I think that regulators have to keep that in mind when they um, deal with AI standards and make sure that these principles that the EU has put forward, fairness, explainability, transparency, reliability, accountability, these things are taken into consideration. So um, against these, this background, Europe has taken a very proactive approach compared to other countries and, and regions of the world and wants to balance this, you know, this tension between having a flexible regulatory framework that allows for innovation um, and allows Europe to be at the forefront of these technologies, but at the same time guaranteeing fundamental rights and, and making sure that our values and democracy really are, are being upheld. The parliament, let me just say, has, as you know, been very, very active on this. A number of committees are dealing with this, the standing committees, plus uh, the Committee on Artificial Intelligence, which, uh, which I have the, the pleasure and the honor to be participating in, which is doing this, this, strat this long-term strategy. And I think that in the end, and I'll close with this, I think that um, for, the, for the parliament, as well as for my political family, which is the EPP, uh, we believe that digital technology doesn't shape people. It, it has to be people who shape it and people who control it. So trustworthy and value-based AI uh, have to be an EU trademark. And, and also they're very important. It's very important for Europe to act collectively on the international scene with like-minded partners to ensure that this technology also uh, upholds our long-standing values of democracy. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Elin uh, Shivo. Elin, the floor is yours for a quick statement. Um, sorry. sorry, I wasn't sure I heard my name. Hi, thank you so much for, for having me today, Brian. Um, there are several things to, to discuss in relation to the topic as a whole, and I would say one would be, do we know what we're asking for and to whom? And the environment of frameworks of, of high-level ethical principles is, is quite saturated, and it's great there's a conversation about it, but a problem about this intention to persist in translating ethical principles into requirements for businesses and their AI systems uh, fails to factor in sometimes the feasibility and practicality aspects of, you know, baking high-level principles into actual processes. So there may be a lack of actionability of these principles, and then there are several examples of that. Uh, that's the first point. Now, a second point is um, the current conversation seems to be assuming that those who are otherwise highly ethical companies would be producing unethical AI if there are no rules or that new rules could force unethical companies to act ethically. We can get back to that perhaps later, uh, but that's another aspect I wanted to bring in. And then a third uh, point um, is th that I wanted to bring up is that the EU thinks of ethical AI as something that could give it a competitive advantage, but the jury is still out as to whether people will buy into ethical AI. Uh, consumers want stuff that works and there's fierce competition out there. So you can do ethics while experimenting with the technology without trying to ban it or limit it because we would just be otherwise ceding the market to competitors who are not reluctant to develop the technology according to their own principles. Um, and next, maybe the EU has other priorities um, that it should focus on in a minute. I mean, we, we might even talk about it today or another time. But if you look at the current state of European Tech Report 2020, the main issues at the top of mind of the respondents uh, across all company sizes was regulatory fragmentation, funding limitations, overregulations, and many other things that have little to do with just ethical principles. Uh, to conclude, there, 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 there may be also other ways to think more creatively about how to ensure trustworthy AI other than burdensome rules. And that also includes making sure we have a population that doesn't fear the technology. And for that to happen, I think we need to 
shift our narratives and, and make sure our discussions are more opportunity focused, maybe set a more positive tone when we talk about AI. And one last point, I definitely concur with the MEPSC Makopoulou about uh, the efficient way to sustain our values and weigh in is to work with, uh, you know, collaboratively with like-minded partners on this. So thank you. Thank you, Lean. Uh, Ree Ferreira, floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Thanks, Brian. And uh, thanks to the other panelists as can well. Can you unmute? Can you unmute, Ree, please? There we go. I am unmuted. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Brian, for the introduction. And thanks to the other panelists as well. Um, I think the key messages around uh, ethical use of AI have already been um, stressed by uh, the other panelists. Uh, as a representative of the insurance industry, I think it's important to understand that uh, the objective of the uh, European Union Digital Single Market Initiative is to improve the access to data and use of data uh, and to create growth opportunities that uh, benefit the society and the economy. Uh, with that in mind, in our view, the development of a regulatory framework must enable the delivery of those objectives, must be adapted to the risks uh, and must encourage investments in trusted innovation while respecting societal values and norms. Uh, like the adoption of any other technology, um, the insurance industry uh, and Zurich Insurance Group will use AI to develop innovative solutions that best protect and serve our customers uh, and contribute to positive and sustainable societal outcomes. Uh, the industry overall code of conduct and uh, uh, in, the, in particular for Zurich Insurance Group, we are guided by three main ethical principles that have already been mentioned by other panelists. The principle of fairness and, uh, in other terms, non-discrimination and the voice, avoidance of bias. The principle of transparency uh, and the associated explainability and the interpretability of outcomes uh, and the aspect of accountability. Uh, traditionally, insurers are sometimes perceived as a, an unfair market player. Um, it is in, uh, important to point out that the, the essence of uh, the insurance business is differentiated risk-based pricing. In other words, insurers set different prices for groups of individuals with different risk levels. Uh, differentiation in this context is justified if uh, individuals manage consciously risk behaviors, uh, risk exposures in different ways. Uh, and this is not discrimination and not unfair per se. It can become discriminating when assumptions regarding the risk behavior uh, are influenced by technical biases which can be potentially aggravated by the use of artificial intelligence. Or when uh, risk assessments are based on data, which cannot be influenced by the individual, such as gender or race. Um, so I think it was important from, from, uh, for, uh, for us as an insurance industry to clearly uh, make a, a distinction between differentiation in terms of risk and discrimination. Uh, to conclude uh, this introduction, uh, as the values of society change and technology and innovation evolve over time, uh, it is important to, for the insurance industry to continuously engage with the multiple stakeholders in the society, actively contribute to this policy debate uh, and uh, regulatory discussion, uh, to ensure that the ethical princi principles guiding the use of AI are aligned with the value systems of societies, taking into consideration regional and cultural differences, uh, and are compatible with the innovation dynamics of artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, I think we will have enough time in the rest of the, uh, this, the debate to focus on uh, the specifics of what we mean by fairness, what we mean by 
transparency and what can we do to ensure that uh, insurers are accountable for the ethical use of AI. Thank you. Hey, Freira, thank you so much. Kilian, uh, just to set the scene for where we are in Europe. Good morning, Eva. Uh, we also have you upside down currently as well. <laughs> so may maybe a metaphor for the summit that's taking place across the street right now. <laughs> we'll get you fixed in a second. Kilian, uh, just to ask you, there's a great song as well uh, by Faith, uh, Paloma Faith, if you want that one too. <laughs> Good to see you anyway. Killian. just to say, in terms of European uh, landscape right now, um, what's, uh, what's happening with ethics and AI? We have the Digital Services Act, Digital Services uh, Market Act, uh, Digital Market Act coming out on the 15th uh, as well. Um, you know, what's the landscape looking like now and what should we anticipate uh, for the, the coming years? Yes, thanks, Brian. I mean, first, let me stress that we don't start from scratch in Europe. We had um, uh, two years of very intense uh, political work on, on AI. We have a strategy on AI. We have an action plan on AI. And we had, above all, a high-level expert group on AI. And this high-level expert group has worked for two years. And they have developed, um, I think, a very good tool, which they have piloted with uh, several hundred participants, uh, a tool which is on the web, which is called Altai which is a self-assessment tool for trustworthy AI. And this group, which was a of distinguished, composed of distinguished experts representing the different parts of society, has come up with certain recommendations how to make AI trustworthy. And on the, we have started to take this up on this basis. And that's where we, uh, we began this journey with the white paper on AI in February this year. Um, we had then a public consultation with an quite overwhelming response, one, more than 1,215 replies and 400 written submissions. And now we have uh, very carefully analyzed this. You can as well find a, a detailed analysis on the AI Alliance page if you wish. It's a lot of interesting reading there out there. And now we are really in the, in the drafting uh, and internal discussion to see how we could transpose this, uh, what we have recognized, what we have learned into um, a legal framework which which uh, fulfills both uh, ambitions or res respect both ambitions to be uh, to create trustworthy AI and not to overburden and not to overregulate and to prevent further innovation. And our plan is now that we will come out in the first quarter of next year with a legal proposal, um, which should then be adopted by the college. And then, of course, it has to be um, uh, discussed and negotiated by the co-legislators and adopted by the legislators, by the European Parliament and by the European Council. And we know that both are very interested in this topic. We have here today two distinguished members of the European Parliament. Uh, the Parliament has a special committee on AI and has delivered very valuable input with uh, excellent resolutions. So we will work then together with the co-legislators after that. Thank you, Kellen. Eva, we have you the right set up now as well. Good to see you. Um, do you want to give a, a quick uh, few remark on, on your perceptions of, of AI ethics? Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say congratulations because I know also you're working in the field of AI ethics and for raising this important issue. Um, I have been working for at least uh, four to five years on AI and uh, since 2016 we started setting an agenda uh, for an ethical framework of artificial intelligence. Um, with the science and technology um, committee, we have been um, trying also to give the direction to the commission um, before it's too late to make sure that this ethical framework uh, will come back to us as legislation. And this is what's happening uh, by 2021. We're expecting to have um, several files and several uh, committees so, um, as you all know, we started the discussion uh, with blockchain, basically, talking about decentralization and the loss of trust to the system and how we can restore that. So, I think with artificial intelligence, we started from there. We want a trustworthy AI. We want a human-centric artificial intelligence uh, because AI is um, an algorithm. It's a system that can um, have automation into solving problems or um, into taking decisions. This could lead into super intelligence, which means it would be difficult for people to control the results or understand them. And this would mean also increased autonomy. Increased autonomy would mean that uh, human autonomy would be reduced. 
So what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that it's going to be ethical by design, to not replace humans, but to complement them. Um, humans would have control over the uses of the artificial intelligence. They have the right to redress. They will have um, the right to have more options and alternatives. So if they want to be offline, they should be able to be offline. And of course, transparency um, to avoid biases and to have explainability of algorithms. I think these are the um, main issues we are trying to address by law. Um, of course, the approach of the Commission is going to be, I, I like it actually, it's, it's a high risk, a low risk approach. So for applications that could be harmful, we're going to have a more security criteria there and of course more ethical restraints. But uh, when it's low risk and uh, we can um, basically open it up into uh, new SMEs and startups to give them access to data, uh, then we will have uh, less strict criteria so we will not stifle innovation. Um, I believe that this is a very good, um, good start and um, let me say that with the pandemic now it's uh, top of our agenda to achieve very fast the legal framework that will give us certainty uh, across uh, Europe. And uh, of course, uh, during the pandemic, we understood how important is data governance that fuel algorithms and the quality of those data and common standards and rules. So we are working with the Center for Artificial Intelligence now under STOA with OECD and we're approaching global organizations in order to not duplicate, but like to see and not overlap, but like to see where we can agree um, uh, and because we need to also protect our democratic systems and we need to make sure that we will be able to exchange uh, useful data. If we had done that uh, with the pandemic, uh, we would have given to our scientists okay, I think we uh, more and um, I think that this is really, and can you hear me? Yes, we you can perfectly me. continue. No, no, we got you back. Okay. So um, I don't want to take more of your time, but just to say that we are doing that to achieve um, common standards and rules. Um, I do believe that we will manage to, to have a toolbox by the end of 21. And I hope that we can protect also our democracies with reciprocity uh, and um, set the rules globally into, um, like we did with GDPR, let's say an updated GDPR, where we will make sure that citizens will feel trusted when they give access to their data, they will be rewarded, and this will be by design. So the, the problem we had with GDPR is that we did not have the audit, we could not control it unless something went wrong. Um, so we were trying to create safety checks and safety guards um, during the whole life cycle of AI to ensure that the rules are being followed, that data are being secured, they are not misused, they are not used across services and products without uh, citizens being aware of what is happening. Um, of course, this could lead to manipulation of perception, uh, micro-targeting. Let me bring could, this to... Um, to... Could, could be extreme. And, and I think this is the, the beginning of our work for 21. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Anna Michelle, uh, Sima Kapilo, you, you, we don't want to frame AI and ethics in a, a bad light. There's a lot of opportunity here, and you spoke about you know, the benefits uh, for health in particular and what we can learn from this, this uh, crisis that we're still passing through at the moment. You know, Killian uh, set out as well, trustworthiness is, is front and center here. If we're to take advantage of the huge opportunities that uh, AI presents for us, that the ethical side of this and the business case, as Aline sets out as well, has got to be framed in in sense of, of trustworthiness. How do we get citizens' trust uh, in in Europe, and at the same time allow uh, companies to develop products which are useful uh, for European society? Um, I, I think you get them involved. I think that's that's uh, that's the main thing. I mean, you know, we 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 do need a change in narrative or a change in our focus on the narrative. Like I said, I think the pandemic has actually given us something positive as a side effect with respect to this, because it's easier to, for me, for example, to explain to my constituency what the benefits are of algorithms that analyze this huge amount of data and how important it is 
to have an international cooperation to make sure that we have access to data. Therefore, we can our scientists can make progress, which is what everybody wants with respect to how you deal with a disease and how you find a cure. So um, what you do is you engage citizens, you explain to citizens. And yes, you need this regulatory framework. Um, I, I just want to address this. I understand that there is this, you know, this tension. and We're trying to find the balance, as the commission said, between allowing innovation and making sure Europe is at the forefront of these developments. But at the same time, we want to make sure that, you know, we live up to our high standards with respect to protecting citizens' uh, civil liberties and, and rights. We're in a totally different context than other countries are who are using this technology um, in, in the form of surveillance capitalism. That's not at all what Europe is about, and it has proven it with, with uh, GDPR. But you know, in in this balance, I think we're we're heading in the right direction because you know we can't just leave this unregulated. We can't allow simple self regulation. I mean, already I think I read in a study from um, the European Consumer Organization in nine European countries that less than twenty percent of Europeans believe that the, the the legislative framework that we have effectively regulates AI, and fifty percent have very low trust in authorities and are afraid that they'll use it excessively. Um, and that's that's an interesting uh, result. I think that um, we we need to be in the center of this spectrum and we can use uh, we can use more, uh, you know, more innovative legislative methods, co-regulation, sandboxes. Uh, I, I take the point that we need to be very close with industry because the developments in this technology are so rapid that they're going to exceed the pace of legislation, certainly in the European Union, but every place else. Um, also, I'll close by saying that that I I, I do welcome these uh, these initiatives internationally. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. We can work with with not just like minded partners, but international organizations like the OECD, which we're doing in Stoa. Uh, because when we build trust, this has to be built internationally. It can't be built in bubbles. Okay. Eileen, okay. this is uh, part of the challenge for you, isn't it? That, uh, so a lot of feedback there. Eileen, this is part of the challenge for, for you as well, is that you know, you're not just working in a European environment. This is a global exercise. The companies that uh, will need to bring these uh, products to market need a global marketplace and not just a European marketplace. How how do you change consumer perception of AI? Which is you know it's it's not easy to see what AI is. It's 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 stuff which is beyond uh, the the comprehension of the average citizen in terms of its complexity, and it's seen as stuff. The technology, the data is not processed beyond any uh, sort of big concept. So, is there an education process where this grand scheme uh, can be better understood and seen in real life applications? for good, and we'll talk about all the bad stuff later, but in terms of educating the citizen for AI for good and the ethics that, uh, that uh, will be built around in terms of trustworthiness, how do you do that? Yeah, I, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I think indeed people should want to be encouraged to learn about the technology to, to so we have to make it more accessible as a topic to them so they can best master it. Uh, I think many are rightly calling for, again, focusing the discussion on the practical opportunities of the technology and really seeing it as an investment rather than just looking at the theory, theoretical risks that exist or, uh, you know, maybe instead of seeing tech as a cost, we should uh, see it um, as something that is an investment. Um, so the reluctance to adopt the technology uh, is an obstacle and uh, public opinion is likely to shape the way in which we will use, deploy and govern the technology. Uh, and also it might uh, stop people from um, developing digital skills. And really, I think I've read that really great line somewhere that uh, no rule or AI regulation can substitute for a literate population. Uh, now, it's uh, just to mention an interesting, uh, something interesting I'm, 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 I noticed in a, in a report, uh, an Oxford University report, um, the worries about AI are high in Europe. You have 40, 43% that say it is mostly harmful. And in China, 
59% said it was mostly helpful and only 9% said it was harmful. So there's really something that we can work on here to increase adoption and alleviate concerns. And again, I think this is really about trying to shift our tone um, to maybe move from this precautionary approach in the narrative to something more positive. Uh, but there's also a lot of things that can be done within the member states because education remains one of their competencies. So I, I guess, you know, the EU can encourage them to develop more courses that are made accessible throughout the curriculum. Is, it, is this a case of, of uh, consumer education or national education in, in the sense that it should be part of the curriculum. You know, it's consumer education. These are essentially uh, uh, consumer products to begin with as well. Even, and we talk about consumer uh, surveillance capitalism uh, a bit later on. But, you know, companies are developing these. We, you know, the Big Brother approach uh, with government is, is something slightly different as well. And even in China, I was reading this morning uh, an excellent article by, by Vice, you know, there, there's a, a case now which has gone through the Chinese courts where uh, unfortunately a law professor went to a zoo and his biometrics and his uh, facial recognition was taken and uh, he objected to this and the Chinese courts have now uh, blocked some avenues for the deployment um, of uh, facial recognition and AI as well. Now this is happening in China and the Chinese government uh, will, seems to be taking the view that there's some separation between what the national interest is and what commercial interest is as well. It could also be very good uh, propaganda approach to this. But what do you uh, do? You see in Europe that we'll we'll move the same direction that the the consumer dimension of AI and ethics will go one direction, and the the governmental side, the public side, will go another a, a different direction. Eileen. No, that's a very good question. Uh, I believe that in Europe we do punish conducts that are unethical. Uh, so I think, for instance, a company like Volkswagen, you know, there's been this, this diesel emission scandal. Um, and it was not the absence of regulations on emission standards that caused it, but it was the company culture that permitted the cheating. So I think there are many things that are not okay in Europe, um, but I'm not sure how to I think there, there's, like uh, MEP Asima Kopulu said, um, there is a dialogue between stakeholders, including policymakers and industry, but maybe there should be more, and that should include consumers as well, to make sure that we move in the same direction and align, not just across member states on any rules that's adopted, but also in terms of thinking. Okay. So. Let me ask uh, Ree Ferreira, you know, is uh, the commercial side of AI getting a bad uh, deal because people see AI in the context of, of government and, and uh, big brother approach as well? Do you, do you think that the education process has a big role to play in how we deploy AI and how we govern with ethics in Europe? Uh, absolutely, Brian. And, Sorry, uh, Ree Ferreira, Ree Ferreira, yeah. Yes, absolutely, Brian. I can't hear. Rick, can you unmute? I am unmuted. Okay, thank you. Yes, absolutely, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Um, there is definitely the need for the insurance industry and to educate the customers on uh, why we are using AI. It's, it's mainly for, for their benefit to be able to develop products and services that, are, that meet their, their needs. Uh, we need to make sure that they understand what are the type of uh, processes and controls and governance mechanisms we have in place to ensure that uh, uh, we use uh, data uh, and the algorithms in a, in a way that it treats customers fairly. Uh, we need to be able to explain properly uh, what type of data we are using for a particular purpose uh, and what are the type of uh, risk factors that might influence a particular decision. Uh, and okay, if and like, we like do uh, we talked about earlier, that's not far removed from the GDPR approach that Eva mentioned as well. You know, the, the framework seems to be there and perhaps we're not and reinventing the wheel this time with AI ethics, but we're building on on what's already existing. So the transparency element uh, that, that you mentioned, you know, what are we, what data is it that we have and what are we using it for seems to be a core principle, Reid. Do you agree with that? Uh, I, I, I do. Uh, but uh, as uh, there are significant concerns in the population about uh, uh, 
the use of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we need to go an extra mile to explain exactly how we are using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and give the customers the opportunity to uh, uh, get an explanation on uh, how, why, and when we are using it. Uh, and uh, if uh, the outcome generated by uh, AI systems or applications uh, come to reach a decision that in any way might uh, affect the individuals, we, need, we must be able to allow them to uh, uh, ask for uh, further explanation uh, and okay. uh, uh, allow for changes on uh, how we are uh, using the technology. Okay, let me put this to Eva Kali as well. Eva, do we have sufficient uh, legal protection? And what I mean by that is not just the, the right uh, of scrutiny, but also do we have a, a, a technical overview? Do we have a, a court perhaps that is able to react sufficiently quickly? Anna Michelle uh, was speaking earlier about uh, the law needing to, to stay at the same pace uh, as innovation, which is near impossible. So you know, a company which was less than judicious in its, uh, its rollout may take chances with AI and ethics. Uh, and we've seen this with Facebook and others in terms of how they behave, um, because they wait for the law to catch up. Do we in Europe have the potential to create a, a legal structure with a court or an adjudicator that will audit and respond quickly to protect uh, European consumers? Is this something we need to build into this process? Excellent question. Whatever is uh, legal offline should be legal online and whatever is illegal offline should be illegal online. So we have to translate the law into the digital era. And there are some challenges because it's not very clear the jurisdiction. We don't have harmonized rules. We have um, geo-blocking. It's not, not very uh, It's not very easy to, to discuss about the new capabilities and understand levels of how the system is for sure I can think of creating ai specific ethics and uh, review committees that they will be interdisciplinary and we need ethics assessment methodologies and certifications and i believe this should happen through um, independent uh, organizations uh, that could be appointed centrally by eu and also with the agencies um, this is one of the proposals that's all now on the table, and uh, we expect to make it, to make it actually an obligation for companies that want to work in uh, Europe and have access to European data to be able also to um, to, to have the responsibility to uh, participate um, and and actually all this uh, of these agencies. Um, I don't know if we need a special uh, legal authority uh, because, as I said, what's illegal, what's not legal, we know it. We know it has to follow the European principles. Um, what we have not done is update our regulations into the digital era. And with the pandemic as a catalyst, we realized we have to do so. Otherwise, okay. actually, we could have stayed at uh, just talking about an ethical framework that wouldn't be binding by law but everybody now speaks more and more about the need to have a uh, clear law and regulation okay Killian, on the same same uh, topic as well do, do you have confidence that the process which is moving forward now will have a structure of adjudication which will be sufficiently rapid uh, to deter bad actors in the market and to give certainty uh, to good actors in terms of, of uh, market opportunity as well and fairness uh, on the on the the AI playing field, to to how how will this be adjudicated? Who would adjudicate it? Uh, as you can see best now. Thanks, Brian. I think I can very well align to what um, Eva Kaili has said because I think it's exactly our approach. We want to transfer the analog world into the digital world, and if you look at AI, and we try to identify what is really the problem. The, it is not that we have not, I think, in Europe enough legal remedies or systems of compliance or checks and balances. 
The problem is that this technology has certain features which are unique. It's uh, there's sometimes a lack of predictability. It's partly autonomous. It's based on data. Uh, there is there may be limited human control, and this all this is then often described as this black box effect. So there is a, an input, and there's an output, and it's difficult to uh, understand or to ju uh, to judge how the the input has uh, created a certain output, and this should not lead to a lack of responsibility. That is the key point. We want that the rights which exist in the analog world are as well defended and enforceable in the digital world, and therefore we need some requirements to make this process, which I just described, transparent. And this is, in a nutshell, what we try to do. And therefore, we think we need um, ex ante requirements on these uh, AI systems, only on those where we really identify a risk, because I, I agree, a lot of AI systems with low risk, for instance, predictive maintenance in factories, machine-to-machine -machine communication, we don't need uh, particular rules. There may be a lot of uh, applications where basically the market will decide if something on your smartphone doesn't work, you don't like uh, um, a gadget, you will not use it. But where it's sensitive, it is important that these checks are there so that it is possible for the individual to understand, yes, there is an AI, I'm informed. I can ask for the documentation how the system has decided. I know there is somewhere a human in the loop or in command to check what has happened and I can challenge this decision in a meaningful way because I have uh, the necessary documentation. This should be done ex ante for trustworthy AI. And then I think the legal system which we have with Ombudsman, with courts, with the European Court of Justice in the very end is well established uh, to, 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 to guarantee the same legal protection that we have in the analog world. And that's exactly but is our it, objective. Is it quick enough? I think, right. is, it not, is part of this discussion not that is it quick enough? Because the speed of market change is so fast that you gain commercial advantage in an instant, and uh, you know, within a year, you could destroy uh, competitors uh, it, it, with a, a strong product as well. You know, and the European Court of Justice doesn't do very much in, in, in a hurry. You know, are our legal systems sufficiently responsive, uh, Killian, to to deal with this new generation of AI and uh, super intelligence, as uh, Eva also mentioned? Um, this is certainly a challenge to speed because the technological development is very quick and it's very difficult to predict what will happen. So we need uh, a future proof legislation which is uh, able to cope and to follow technological developments in order to be updated. Because you're right, uh, there can be a groundbreaking technology and it can be very quick and it can destroy competitors. But we think we can make this regulation or this future legal act sufficiently future proofed by allowing adaptations. And at the same time, we are convinced that if we don't do this, the, the, the counter effect would be that the consumers would not trust AI. I don't think we need now to put in principle in question our legal system, our courts. It is not so much that we don't have courts or that we don't have uh, uh, um, expedient procedures or anything like this. The problem is more that uh, can the people make meaningful use of these remedies which exist? Because if there is an AI system, they may not just have the elements which they need to check something. And I think with the ex-ante system or in a control system, normally things should just not enter on the market because it is clear that we want to create a level playing field. Once we have the system in place, only AI which corresponds to these requirements will be able to be used for certain purposes. Thank you. Eva Kali, you wanted to respond. Then I want to go to Anna Michelle to talk about surveillance capitalism a little bit. Eva. Yes. Um, so I think we have to have exposed rules too. We have to definitely uh, follow specific apps and be able to audit them. Um, so maybe an ombudsman that uh, has a better understanding for AI and follows the ethics and the compliance of the companies would be, be necessary. Make sure that this obligation and the burden of proof will uh, lay on the hands of the companies. So they will have the obligation to prove that they didn't uh, overcome their, um, their limits. Um, because, you know, also it's very difficult to understand that citizens are aware of uh, all the small letters that they hide in the details on how they are, uh, their data are being used and shared. And I have, we need a more, uh, let's say, grandma friendly approach so, so that they have options. So when you use your device, you have to be able to have the choice that your microphone is off when you're not using an application and not constantly on or off. 
um, which means that when you have and when you receive targeted advertisement, you have a clear understanding why this happened and your perception would not be completely misled by the advertisements you receive. And also you understand that um, the profit that they make, it's something that you give away for free. I would say cheap action, of course, excellent services and personalization is convenient. But then your data are, are because you're a generator for them of data and content. I think they should be uh, more valuable and you should be also rewarded if they want to transfer them throughout their services and the products, especially of the big ones, the gatekeepers. And what we need to achieve in order to, um, to make this clarification is need also clear definitions of who is a, a gatekeeper and what are the responsibilities of the biggest players that they own more data okay. um, at this point and also how they use uh, the data at the second phase. Okay, Eileen. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to react to a few things that I've heard before uh, regarding the type of framework that we should have and you know the types of principles that we should apply, that they should be similar online uh, to those we have in the analog world. Uh, the thing is, we're not. We, we want what we want to do with current proposals seems to be that we want to hold the technology to standards that we don't even uh, are, that we're not even holding uh, human beings accountable for. Uh, and I think we have to be very thoughtful and careful when it comes to uh, what we call blanket regulations. That would be again one size fits all for you know systems that are very diverse. Uh, that are you know constantly evolving as well uh, and this proposal of you know conformity assessments well maybe we don't have I, I don't know where the expertise is to be able for us to audit as, as, as Europe to audit those algorithms the, the proposal might cause cause delays and additional costs and also data it ignores that data is maybe global and, and the solutions that are built and that are you know accurate and robust and perform well are often not those that only include or a benchmark against European data. Uh, one example I wanted to take uh, to refer to what was mentioned is explainability. Explainable AI is a developing research field, but it's not something that we can expect for all AI systems yet. So maybe a better way, rather than imposing requirements that would be impractical for some AI systems, it would be better to invest in that research and maybe try to go further there first. Um, let, me ask finally, you explain, let me just ask you about explainability while you're on that. Explainability for whom? You know, does the consumer really need to understand or do we need to have uh, strong guardians who are able to uh, interpret that black box, uh, translate that into the transparency requirements and, and audit the, the good or lack of uh, for the consumer? Who, who needs uh, to have this explainability? I think consumers understand statistics better than policymakers may think, or that we may think, even in our bubble. Um, but you know, they don't need, they don't read their terms and conditions. I think 13% of Europeans actually do, um, and they don't necessarily need to have this complicated jargon. Um, and it's the same with this list of ethical principles that is being uh, sent to developers. I mean, there's a, a gap in the language there, and so I think it would just be. It would not be meaningful to send, you know, very long explanations. And actually, if you okay. uh, if you look at healthcare, uh, a genomics company that worked with the UK government—I don't remember the name—said that sick people and healthy people have a different way to be okay with sharing their data and and you know the extent to which they want to know what's going on. Sick people want answers; they want their data to be used, and they want access to be maximized for research to make progress and advances. So sometimes, you know, consumers don't always need. You know, as long as there are safeguards saying your data will not be used for this or that, or you have a simple explanation of an algorithm, I don't think we need to go too far in this either. But, but, but just the very example that you gave proposes that there's a vulnerability, and that wouldn't certainly wouldn't be the only one, a vulnerability that can be exploited for the benefit of those uh, companies developing. Let me just switch to a second to uh, surveillance capitalism, Anna Michelle. You know, surveillance capitalism has the capacity to nudge the market and nudge policy one direction or another without us perceiving it as well. And this is, you know, Eva spoke earlier about the superintelligence, is that we assume that we can work out what's in the black box, but the speed of change inside that black box, and as quantum uh, computing comes online, it's going to be even more challenging. You know, in terms of AI and ethics, how do you see surveillance capitalism 
and legislation, regulation. Is this, is our legislation, is our regulation even capable of being fit for purpose in this context? Sure it is. I mean, I, first of all, let me just get my two cents into the into the, the future proofing. And I, I'm definitely in faith. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of, you know, doing making a new court for this. I mean, I think just like citizens can be more informed, so can lawyers like myself and legislators who are learning a lot about AI, so can judges. So that's not the that's not the issue for me. For me, the issue is the ex ante approach and future proofing regulation also means that, you know, you have to um, you have to have flexibility and adaptability and you have to um, you have to move forward in this way. And also you can have, you know, provisional measures that allow for quick redress, just like you can have in trade. You can have the same thing for people to, you know, to deal with uh, AI, AI applications that are moving fast and have uh, uh, adverse consequences on competition, for example. But when when it comes to this surveillance capitalism question, um, yeah, I, I, you can see what's happening in China. And this is why when we have this discussion, I think we need to have uh, a geopolitical also um, lens through which we look at our, our regulatory uh, efforts and creating this techno, this international techno alliance that I was telling you before, which can ex ante put some serious rules based on our democratic values. You know, I mean, it, it's no it's no secret that China is investing billions in AI, uh, 5G, quantum computing, all of this is part of this strategy that they launched in 2017 to reestablish themselves as the world's AI leader. And I think that you know, by, by 2030, they expect to have invested some huge amount, at least like $150 billion. So, you know, while China does all this, deals IPR, lures countries into their techno orbit, I think that um, we need to remember that they have 1.4 billion people who are producing data and they, they use this. Uh, to invest in, in this technology and to test it. And in, and they have also their own tech giants that they fund with state subsidies abundantly as long as the tech companies, you know, play the, the Communist Party surveillance state game. So, you know, I understand that in the narrative, um, as mentioned before, only 9% of Chinese are saying that, that they think AI is a good thing. But frankly, when your biggest fear is that the state is, is you know looking into what you're saying? How are you going to express an adverse opinion anyway? I I would wonder. Okay. Um, this is something okay. Europe needs to take into account when it makes its decisions. Okay. Thank you, uh, Eline. Uh, I'll go back to, to this in just a moment. Uh, Eline, uh, so a lot of feedback there. Uh, Re, let me ask you this uh, as well. In terms of surveillance capitalism, again, it's easy to say this is uh, a negative thing. Uh, but nudge behavior can work in two ways as well. And I wonder whether the insurance industry, as an example, uh, in terms of healthcare, uh, is it possible that the insurance industry, when, it, when it's regulating, you, you made the distinction between discrimination uh, and uh, the classification element as well, H how can you change uh, public behavior for the good using insurance as well? For example, if someone changes their behavior and goes to the gym or eats in a, in a particularly healthy way, which can, can, be, can be assessed, can you reduce uh, risk premiums accordingly? And does that become a nudge behavior for general public health? I know it's, it's a very uh, basic uh, perception, but is this the kind of behavior that can be altered uh, by the use of AI and uh, better, better intelligence? That's right, uh, Brian. Uh, in an insurance context, we uh, nudging tends to influence healthier behaviors, as you mentioned. Uh, and uh, less risky behaviors. Uh, the, however, excessive forms of nudging can become a threat to customers' autonomy or self-determination. If, uh, if you go too far in influencing how much you exercise, uh, or, or the way you exercise, the way you drive, uh, and uh, even uh, the way you live, uh, then this becomes uh, uh, clearly uh, a threat to the autonomy of the customers. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, excessive nudging can contribute to discrimination. Uh, in, in general, health-related lifestyles 
uh, often correlate with uh, income and education level. Uh, so if uh, uh, individuals feel constrained in their life lifestyle choices, uh, particularly if uh, unhealthy choices, uh, then they might be uh, associated, uh, they will translate into higher premiums. Okay, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me put this to, to Eva Carly, then we're going to take some questions as well. We've got a lot of questions coming in uh, from our audience. Eva, in terms of inequality, are you concerned that uh, the ethics behind AI can increase inequality? And, and we just uh, mentioned, you know, if we nudge too far, certain elements are put out of place as well. You know, how do you see inequality in European society and AI ethics? Is there a need to, to address this or is this taken care of? Of course, it's not taken care of. And Brian, thank you for your uh, excellent questions because you're driving like an, an, a very interesting conversation. So we had with us um, two days ago, uh, Susanna Zubov talking about surveillance capitalism. She uh, actually introduced us to this um, um, to this word, um, a new a new meaning of uh, uh, seeing how AI could work and what it could lead us to. Um, uh, to have to face and of course increased inequalities will be the result if we don't do something but we do have the choice and the options in front of us to decide what kind of world we need and how AI should complement us so when I said we have to translate um, what EU is based on our principles into the digital era. I mean, of course, you cannot be excluded by an AI system. You cannot be discriminated. As you mentioned, insurance companies cannot use data that they, they find online from your Google search or your photos to increase your um, risk profile. Um, definitely, this is, will not happen in Europe because we know uh, we have the vision. We just have to um, change the law and adapt it into the new uh, into the new era. So I think that we risk now to have in the hands of the data owners uh, like an elite that could control uh, even uh, lead uh, behaviors, and of course uh, without not just explainability but real understanding of how the AI system works it will be difficult to fight that so i think we need also to have um people that are knowledgeable of this technology to support like a task force that could support citizens when they face um, discrimination or exclusion from uh, what we consider um to be a right in in europe um as uh, if you explain it to my mother what happened with ai system she won't be able to um, to go against a big, a big company. So we need clear rules, clear definitions, and we need okay. to set up um, a, a, a people that are technologically knowledgeable with uh, the independent agencies that I mentioned in order to have safety controls because the tension with the globalization and now with AI is to have more and more inequalities. So of course we can stop it, but we have to decide and act and act together as a European Union because this goes beyond borders and I think okay. it since it's a threat of democracies and since Anna said China is has a different mentality and a different system we have to protect also our political system okay so guardians for the good a uh, question uh, for Killian from Jens uh, Rutig uh, Killian would you expect the AI legal proposal to be published at the beginning of Q1 2021 or rather towards the end? That's at least a straightforward question after all your difficult questions Brian. Uh, I would uh, it's, it's not entirely in my in my hands but I would expect it would be uh, more towards the end of Q1. Okay, thank you. And uh, could you use this from Oliver Gray? Could you use a separate AI to help the ethical checkers? Okay, could you use a separate AI to help the ethical checkers to ensure that ethical principles can be applied? Eileen, can we use AI to protect ourselves against AI? Uh, yeah, actually, you can. Of course, the you have to make sure to keep in mind that it's a rudimentary technology in some ways. So, you know, it's not a silver bullet. And also it's good to recall here that uh, when we talk about algorithmic bias, you know, this is also a statistical term to refer to 
you know, alg just to put it very simply, algorithms are discriminatory by nature. You don't want Zalando to recommend you men's clothes when you're a girl who might want to, you know, wear some sort of more diverse kind of, you know, clothes. Um, so I you can actually... I think the first rule is don't, don't let your kids use your Zalando account. That will help with the AI regulation a little bit as well. Uh, okay, uh, there's another question just, just on exactly this issue. There's another question as well. So, um, you can, Aileen, answer this and then I'll give it to uh, Anna as well. Aileen, uh, what regulatory steps can be taken to avoid the usage of biased AIs that contribute to systemic uh, discrimination? Aileen, first. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. Was... Which, uh, which regulatory steps can be taken to avoid the usage of biased AIs that contribute to systemic discrimination? Uh, so then, you know, some processes that uh, companies can uh, experiment with, you can have responsible processes that mitigate bias. If you're deploying AI, you can use tools and practices like internal red teams or third party audits. Uh, you can, you know, on the side of policies, you can have uh, easier business access to richer data, have multidisciplinary teams, uh, you know, develop methods that improve bias detection, uh, use synthetic data. Uh, you can use, um, uh, I think there was even some crowdsourcing efforts to increase the quality of your data, uh, sentiment analysis. So there's many, of, many things okay. that companies can do that don't necessarily okay. involve regulation. Let me ask uh, Anna Michelle the, the same same question. Any regulatory steps in addition to what uh, Aline uh, has proposed there uh, that can be used to uh, avoid systemic discrimination? Yeah, well, she pretty much didn't leave anything out there, so so right. Aline pretty much covered. I mean, yeah, no, no, and and uh, and um, as as uh, Eva will tell you when she chairs the Stoa, I mean, she's she, we've looked into this issue. Uh, extensively and seeing what everybody else is doing, including like the OECD the other day, which has lots of ideas. So there's, let's just say there's not a shortage of tools. Uh, it's okay. more a question of getting organized. Okay, um, this a uh, question for Re. Uh, so Martin uh, Michelot, uh, do you believe that independent conformity assessment can help create trust in AI systems or are there other options? So do you believe that independent conformity assessment can help create trust in AI systems, Re. Uh, I'm not sure I understand fully the question. Uh, okay. In terms how, of how, well, let, let me ask you in terms in terms of your own experience in Zurich. Um, how do you ensure uh, that there's a there's a conformity in terms of of, of system a uh, systematic conformity internally when it comes to your AI uh, systems? So we, we are in the process of uh, deploying uh, an overall AI assurance framework and governance framework that uh, introduces a number of processes and controls and checks uh, that need to be uh, uh, followed ev for every AI solution that is development and throughout the full development life cycle. And this includes controls to ensure that uh, we don't. We adhere to the principles of fairness. We adhere to. We are able to uh, explain uh, the outcome generated by the algorithms. And if you are not able to explain them, then probably we should not use that type of data for that particular purpose. Uh, and uh, test the outcomes not only uh, with. Uh, uh, using local uh, internally inter interdisciplinary teams and cross-functional teams as a, has been suggested, but also involving uh, external stakeholders like consumer protection uh, associations and uh, focus groups and so on. So there are uh, a variety of uh, mechanisms we are considering to ensure uh, that uh, the algorithms that are being used are fair, are transparent, and uh, we are fully accountable and able to explain uh, why we are using them, when we are using them, and for what. Okay, thank you. Um, question for Killian, I think. Uh, explainability is from the Theodorus uh, Vangio. I uh, think explainability may make AI even riskier, uh, he says, especially in high-risk cases uh, like in healthcare due to technical and human factors. How do regulators plan to ensure they manage the output safe safely 
uh, is uh, AI and explainability really safer and not, uh, not the input uh, requires AI explainability. So basically, how do, how do we make, uh, is the simplification required by making something explainable a risk element in terms of assessing uh, AI as well? Does that make sense to you? Well, of course, um, we believe that, of course, um, if this example conformity assessment is carried out by by external bodies, these these bodies must uh, must be certified and must be fully trustworthy because they might, in particular, in the health sector, deal with very um, very sensitive data, and they have to fully respect the data the general data protection regulation, and they uh, will get the data on a need to know basis, and they of course have to uh, to respect all privacy rules, and it should not be this is not a marketplace. These will be. Um, uh, authorities which are certified, controlled, and checked by the state, and this stays within in the wider field in the in the state remit. So in the public remit, it's not for market and it's not for publication. So I think um, we have as well experience because if you look now in medical device regulation or other regulations, there are of course similar checks are, are done, and we have to ensure that we have the same level of uh, discretion and privacy as well there. And perhaps at this occasion I may add, because uh, Eva Kylie just uh, mentioned that before in the discussion, our system would of course as well be accomplished by ex post monitoring. So ex ante and ex post always go together and we need of course a, a life cycle monitoring of these products, uh, even if we will start of course before the products come to the market, but that will continue. Okay, thank you. Eva, there's a, a quote I really like, a, a line I really like in the Commission paper, Ethics Guidelines for Trustworthy AI Shaping Europe's Digital Future. And it says, humans need to be aware that they are interacting with an AI system and must be informed of the system's capabilities and limitations as well. This, this strikes me as something which you could read on, on uh, the guidance of, of any food uh, product as well. You've got to know what's, what's in the packet and you've got to know what you can use it for and what you can't use it for. Do you see a, a, a consumer strategy with AI and ethics as well? That you know, we, we talk about traffic light system uh, for food as well. Is there the possibility, is there discussion about something similar to help explain to the consumer what they're getting themselves into? Eva Carly. Of course, Brian. Uh of course, we need to achieve that not just for, um, as you mentioned, also for consumers, not just for users. Um, and we have done something similar for political advertisements where you understand that it's sponsored, you can see who sponsored it, what amount they gave and who they targeted. I think this will ensure that we have the freedom of choice and it's not being altered by targeted advertisements or micro-targeting. So for sure we need to have more controls there and um, more controls to achieve freedom of choice. Um, I've, I've been um, participating in events and people start with uh, the word, I'm afraid, I'm worried that I will not have the freedom of choice, that I will not be aware that I don't have this freedom because of all the suggestions that are helping me to have a personalized experience and I out AI system. So for sure, I think we need to have, um, as you very well said, guardians for good to achieve that. And um, I agree also with Aline, we have to um, we have to have data that will be uh, multidisciplinary and also independent authorities to control that and to control and safeguard that the training data are also representative of um, of different choices that we should have. Uh, so to make sure that citizens are aware, we definitely need time for them to develop also the skills, but we need to make it plain and simple that they receive something specific based on the data that they generated or um, uh, as GDPR poses, we have to have a specific uh, uh, principle on, on how you use uh, the purpose that you use the data for. Um, it's not it's not easy, uh, but we have to make sure that it's going to be also by default okay. um, the protection of consumers. And I say that because, you know, Brian, if you enter your mobile phone and you try to switch off how your data are being used, it's a labyrinth and you can never figure it out. So yeah. by default, it should be safe and trustworthy for citizens to use all these applications and then to actually ask them to have clear consent, not silence, or not just okay. like a dilemma, yes or no, to use the app. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm just in a moment going to ask each of our panelists uh, for their, their final 30-second uh, uh, remark, their highlight of uh, what's important in this issue. Uh, but just before that, Anna Michelle, uh, in, in October the Parliament uh, laid out its uh, AI uh, uh, regulation suggestions uh, in, and one line in the, in the what it said was high-risk AI technologies uh, such as those with self-learning capabilities should be designed to allow for human oversight at any time. Uh, is this something you agree with? How, how should high-risk AI technologies be uh, overseen uh, with human guidance uh, at any time? Uh, is there discussion about how that would actually work? I think that, Brian, the, the, you know, the introduction of the risk factor as uh, the 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 distinguisher or the the line that that helps you balance between letting this technology flourish and help and make our lives better and protecting our rights is is a very good uh, criterion and that's why we focused on it on uh, as parliament in this report so assessing the risk that a technology has on you also gives you let's say uh, a heightened awareness that you need to regulate more whether throughout the entire life cycle as as uh, you know as you heard before I mean the, the greater the risk the more the regulatory intervention at all stages um, in terms of assessing the potential encroachment to your to your rights and um, how to how to deal with this more proactively so I think this is this is definitely the best criterion we could have all, converged around. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, go to our, our closing uh, remarks. Eileen Chivot, your, uh, your 20, 30 seconds max on uh, what, the, what the way forward is here with the AI and ethics. Race, right? And I think in a race, winning matters. And, and Europe has talent research funding uh, to be able to transform itself into, you know, or at least lead a little bit more in, in, in AI. But I think just the focus on ethics will not necessarily help it get there faster. And I think we have to be careful when it comes to the trade offs between the requirements uh, we want to impose on AI systems and the reality of it. And finally, just real quick, because I've listened to a podcast recently, and I thought that was very interesting to inject in a debate. When you ask for ethics from an organization, um, you know, there are humans behind it, uh, and the allegiance of human beings are maybe to their family, their friends, their organization, uh, to the company, and then to society and humanity as a whole. But maybe this come a little bit later. So it is also important to keep in mind, that, you know, to what extent can we identify with the purpose of who we work with. Okay. And so I just thought it was a nice thing to add. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Killian, the, the, the focus on the way forward, where should we go? I think the, 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 we should continue this, this path of looking at both sides of AI to look at the, the potential and at the risks. So we should really uh, continue to support. The Commission has the target of having 20 billion investment in AI, public and private, every year. At the same time, we should look for a future proof legislation to, to address uh, risks and concerns. And this re regulation, in my view, should really be risk-based. It should be future-proof. It should be clear so that our developers and providers are not prevented from um, innovation. And it should, uh, and I think that's as well an outcome of today's discussion, it should really be tailor-made because we have to take into account that AI may be used for a whole plethora of different cases. So we need to be uh, adapted uh, and adaptable to these different individual situations. Killian, thank you. Ree Ferreira, the way forward. Uh, I think the previous panelists have already uh, stressed the most important points. And uh, as a representative of the insurance industry, we will definitely welcome uh, a standard approach for ethical use of AI. Uh, and uh, we will do our best to embed the ethical principles of fairness, transparency, and accountability in uh, how we conduct business. Thank you. Eva Kiley. Well, um, thank you, Brian, again. So um, I would take it from you and say that I'm happy that the companies, they have decided to follow uh, their own rules, but I believe that we need to have a regulatory framework that it's going to be um, an effort to apply global common standards and rules that we all should follow. And we will balance the profit between businesses and the benefits for citizens 
uh, maybe we have we should have human rights um, impact assessments for and meaningful control of AI. And finally, we should not compromise safety for privacy or privacy for safety. We should be able with the technologies we have to have both. So what we need to achieve is to make sure that ethics will be um, there by design and by default, and we will give more choices for uh, for citizens, users, and consumers. Thank you, and Michelle, last word. You know, as we, we move out of this pandemic, I think that it's very clear that the future is, is, is largely digital and AI is a very powerful tool. I think when we regulate, we need to remember what's at stake. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that there's nothing, nothing is certain anymore. And that includes democracy. So I, I would, as a closing word, say that our path in the new normal and the new digital world uh, we need to follow the path of democracy. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our panelists this morning. Uh, it's a huge subject. I think you've done extremely well to uh, hit uh, a lot of targets very precisely uh, this morning. So thank you for that. Thank you also to our audience uh, for a uh, gr great audience online and uh, the questions you sent in today. Uh, we also note that this is a very gender balanced uh, panel today. Uh, we uh, try at your active to always uh, achieve that. And thanks to our team today, Molto, Jacques, uh, Simona and uh, Matteo as well. I'm Brian McGuire. I wish you a good afternoon.